stories. Government working to rectify the situation related to the long service gratuity and severance payments. Barbados' Attorney General wants alternatives to prisons. And U.S. House Intelligence Committee says no evidence Obama wiretapped Trump. Hello and welcome to the ZIZ Midday Newscast. Today is Monday, the 20th of March, 2017. I am Shaira Flanders. Nationally, the government of St. Kitts and Nevis is continuing its work to rectify the situation related to the long service gratuity and severance payments. That is according to Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, Dr. the Honorable Timothy Harris, who was at the time speaking on WinFM's Voices program on Tuesday, March 14th. Prime Minister Harris told the listeners that the severance payment fund is currently, quote, over its ability to pay by $10 million as a result of hemorrhaging by the former administration. Administration. He made reference to July 2013, stating that the Denzel Douglas-led administration passed in the National Assembly the Protection of Employment Amendment Bill 2013, and while Dr. Harris said the policy in itself might have been good in theory, it was the implementation he believes that worsened the situation. In the dying moments of the last administration, it went to Parliament, amended the Severance Act, the Employment Act, basically to allow it to provide long-service gratuities to persons who were involved in manufacturing and largely in the tourism sector, the Prime Minister said. It was a good idea to help people, but again it was bad in its implementation like the VAT. So a good policy could become bad as a result of its implementation, end of quote. The nation's leader went on to explain that despite its amendment to the bill, the government then did not carve out a particular mode for funding for the long service gratuity payments. He said, quote, you had a situation which was known to them then that the severance fund was already being hemorrhaged. The severance fund was in the red. It was basically operating in a bankruptcy mode because the inflows were inadequate to meet the outflows that were demanded by law by the particular beneficiaries and so the last government added to the trouble with respect to the fund by putting another pressure point long service gratuities to bear by the same fund. Prime Minister Harris continued, a fund that couldn't service its primary responsibility to make severance payments became worse in that it now had to service the long service gratuity payments in addition to the severance. At a media briefing in May of 2016, Dr. Harris said there exists a backlog of gratuity claims against the fund going as far back as 2009. Cariella Liebert is this year's Miss Black Sand Swimsuit Queen. Liebert beat out four other competitors to snag the Black Sand Swimsuit title. Teresa Diaz secured the first runner-up position, while Shimura Samuel claimed the second runner-up position. Petition Soka artist Shana and Unoma Allen, also known as Lady Sunshine, hosted the event. The Genesis Band provided musical entertainment. The newly crowned queen will represent the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis in the first ever Miss Blackson Swimsuit Pageant Regional in Sandy Point on April 16th. Liebert will be competing with countries such as Jamaica, Dominica, Bahamas, Haiti, Senegal, Guyana, St. Martin, Anguilla, and many other countries. The Black Sand Bang Along Festival is being held under the theme A Cultural Fete at Beltet. Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Agriculture on Nevis, Eric Evelyn, says preparations for staging the Department of Agriculture's 23rd Agriculture Open Day are progressing smoothly. The two-day event hosted by the Department of Agriculture from March 30, 2017 at the Villa Grounds in Charlestown will be held under the patronage of Ms. Tizina Brooks, a long-serving field worker at a government-owned farm. Evelyn told the Department of Information recently that combating the negative effects of climate change in is a critical issue for the department and farmers on the island and the theme is seeking to urge farmers to embrace modern technology for greater food security. Last year's Open Day also focused on climate change but served to bring awareness of the phenomenon to patrons. In addition to the ministry and department's presentation of plaques to farmers and staff, Evelyn explained that the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation on Agriculture, or IICA, would be making presentations. He said in recognition of the organization's 25th year of operations in St. Kitts and Nevis and its 75th anniversary since its establishment, IICA would be presenting 
presenting plaques to livestock and crop farmers, an agro-processor and departmental staff. The open day will be held under the theme, Embracing Climate Smart Agriculture to Achieve Greater Food Security. Moving on to news on the regional scene in Barbados, Attorney General Adriel Brathwaite says the courts need additional resources to help steer some offenders away from prison. We hear more in this Nation News Barbados report. Attorney General Adriel Brathwaite believes Caribbean countries should do more to divert offenders away from prison. Delivering the Democratic Labour Party's lunchtime lecture on Friday, he said prisons were unable to adequately rehabilitate inmates. He suggested that more money be invested in the court system to provide more effective intervention. I championed the drug treatment court that we launched um, here um, two years ago. Um, let us treat to what has brought this young person to the criminal behavior. And if we can do that, then hopefully that we can save more of them because, as I said, the answer cannot be let us send them, let us send them all to prison where and again, that's why I made the point in terms of let's in, less enhance and improve the criminal justice system and in, in particular the courts, give them additional resources. Because as it stands, in almost all of our territories, and I'm very confident about this, in all of our territories, that none of the prisons have the resources to carry out the type of reforms that, that is required. Then, you know, if a, if a chap has um, an addiction issue, none of them has the resources in the prison to treat the addiction. Um, you know, if he has psychiatric issues, the resources are not there, you know, etc. So, so sending him into the prison for five years or six years, for him to sit down, um, learn his craft better, and then be released back into our society cannot be the answer. So I think, as, as I said, I, I, as a region, um, I would recommend that we spend more money enhancing our court systems, um, doing the kind of approach that, that I want to see, have specialized courts, um, have family courts, juvenile courts, etc., so that we can treat to the individual as an individual, as opposed to as a statistic. So let us, you know, just get the case out, out of the way. Saint Lucia is getting help from a United States development partner to reduce energy costs in tourism, the country's largest electricity consumer sector. We hear more in this HCS Saint Lucia report. The training with the St. Lucia Hotel and Tourism Association is part of the USAID's Caribbean Clean Energy Program, CARCEP. The landmark program hopes to bolster energy efficiency in the Caribbean's hotel sector, the largest electricity consumer sector in the region. This week, CARCEP training came to St. Lucia. Chief Executive Officer of the SLHDA, Norani Aziz, has applauded the move towards greening the local hospitality sector. The workshop is very important to us as an SLHDA uh, because it allows our properties to look at opportunities to reduce their operating costs and to, ex or to benchmark the use of energy um, on property with a view to incurring savings lower on down the road. Uh, we're pleased to be collaborating with the USAID CARSEP program to ensure that our, our hotels get exposure to a software that will allow them to benchmark their energy uses and to look at uh, more efficient energy uh, habits on property. Aziz says the initiative is expected to appeal to a lucrative niche tourist, the eco-traveler. See from the data that eco-tourists have a tendency to spend more, they uh, interact with the environment more frequently, they engage the communities more, uh, but they want to ensure that the properties that they, that they engage and, 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 and spend their time at um, are very environmentally conscious. Globally, the whole issue of the impact of, of tourist, tourism practices on the environment or sustainable tourism is becoming a, a very big phenomenon globally and a lot of guests are being very um, deliberate about where they spend their money based on the environmental practices of that destination and the hotels themselves. Owen Gunning is an energy engineer and the director of engineering at the University of Technology in Jamaica. He is also the program's development specialist. He says the goal is a reduction in hotels' energy consumption. We intend to present a number of, of tools. Um, uh, first, we starting with the benchmarking tool, and then we will go into specific areas of, of energy conservation, um, value of energy efficiency, um, financial um, tools, um, benchmarking tools, we're going to be looking at um, 
how you you look at risk mitigation um, you know to that people who are interested in investing in renewable energy and the barriers they have to overcome so you know we we intend to go into specific technical solutions CARCEP is a five-year program and officials hope it will result in Caribbean countries establishing effective policy and regulatory environments as well as incentives for low emission growth in energy. It is based on the reality of the regional energy sector. Caribbean countries remain heavily dependent on imported oil and despite recent dips in world oil prices, electricity costs in the region remain among the highest in the Western Hemisphere. The project hopes to assist public and private sector entities to invest in renewable energy for a sustainable future. On to news on the international scene, the chairman of the U.S. House Intelligence Committee says he does not believe Barack Obama spied on President Donald Trump. Republican Devin Nunes also says he has seen no proof Russia colluded with Trump's election campaign. On Monday, the U.S. Senate panel is holding a real public hearing into Russian meddling in the vote. Al Jazeera's James Bay's report from Washington, D.C. Just over two weeks ago, it was here at his Florida resort club that President Trump took to Twitter, making the explosive allegation that he'd been wiretapped by President Obama. Since then, the White House has provided no proof whatsoever for that very specific allegation, despite two weeks of continuous questioning. Are you saying that the president still stands by his allegation? How confident is President Trump that any evidence uh, will arise to support his claim? Is the White House come up with any evidence whatsoever? Press Secretary Sean Spicer has tried defending his boss's comments a number of ways, even reading out media articles, one of which claimed with no evidence that Obama had used the UK's spy agency to monitor Trump. He used GCHQ. What is that? It's the initials for the British Intelligence Spying Agency. That angered one close ally and another, Germany, was publicly irritated when the president doubled down on his claims in the presence of Chancellor Merkel. He made things worse Thank by recalling the fact she'd once been bugged by U.S. intelligence. At least we have something in common, perhaps. <laughs> Top leaders on Capitol Hill have all said they've seen no evidence to support the president's tweets including the chairman of the Intelligence Committee. The president doesn't go and physically wiretap something. So if you take the president literally, it didn't happen. No evidence to support the president's claim that he was wiretapped by his predecessor. On Monday, Chairman Nunes will chair an open televised hearing in which the FBI director, James Comey, will give evidence. He's certain to be asked if the president's allegations have any credibility. When the hearing takes place, expect to hear a term the U.S. intelligence community uses incidental collection. By law, U.S. citizens cannot have their communications monitored. But when a foreign national is under surveillance and they call or email an American, those contacts can get swept up in the investigation. Some Republicans are already seizing on that. Even if Trump himself was not wiretapped, maybe some of those close to him were. One example may be General Mike Flynn, Trump's former national security adviser, forced to resign for not disclosing details of his meetings with the Russian ambassador. But of course, this only again raises issues that could be damaging for the White House. Russian hacking in the election and possible links between members of the Trump campaign and Vladimir Putin's government. James Bayes, Al Jazeera, Washington. Thousands of people have been made homeless in Nigeria after security forces used bullets, tear gas and bulldozers to push them out of a waterfront slum. Amnesty International, the rights monitor, has condemned the action by government, calling it a brutal and illegal demolition of the Otodobami fishing community in Lagos. Al Jazeera's Neve Barker has the latest on that story. The diggers came without warning making light work of the brittle houses as the community looked on. This had been a slum like no other, built on a lagoon in the heart of Nigeria's biggest city, Lagos. A bustling fishing settlement, home to 300,000 people, many of them migrants. Elizabeth Tosan is one of many whose homes were crushed. Her three children picked through the debris, trying to salvage what's left of their school books. 
The security forces came the night before, she said, with bulldozers and tear gas. When the community resisted, they started shooting and crushing their homes. The clearance happened in spite of a court ruling made in January, ordering the government to consult residents before evicting them. An aid group that's helping the community with its legal battle says the government's actions are illegal. The court has actually found that the demolition that took place here and the types of demolitions that have been taking place, rendering people homeless without alternative, constitutes cruel, inhuman and degrading treatment in violation of the Constitution. This is the second time in five months that houses have been demolished here. In December, around 30,000 people were forced to leave. 11 people were reportedly killed in the process, but many still return to rebuild their homes. In this city of 23 million people, land is a precious commodity. These waterfront plots, a prime site for developers. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera. And now for the weather. Present weather is partly sunny. Winds are blowing from the southeast to east to southeast at 7 to 11 miles per hour. Today will be sunny with a high of 79 degrees Fahrenheit, while tonight will be mostly clear. The overnight low is expected to be 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Sunset today will be at 6.22 p.m. That brings us to the end of the ZIZ Midday Newscast. Join us this evening for these stories and more in detail. Thank you so much for tuning in. I am Shaira Flanders. Have a good one.